Yeah, thanks uh, for the invite, uh, Avi. Uh, so it, it, uh, it also gave me the opportunity to meet my collaborator, Gabor. So I had, we were only corresponding by email, actually. Gabor, who's in Budapest, uh, uh, Jimmy, who's at uh, Sydney, and me. So Jimmy and me Skyped regularly, but uh, Gabor would not even Skype. So it was very nice to see him in person. So thanks again. Yeah. So uh, the uh, so as uh, we mentioned, so we'll be giving. Uh, we, I'll talk about joint work. Uh, uh, so this is an algebraic algorithm for uh, for calculating uh, the non-commutative rank, and this works over uh, reasonably sized fields. So it works over all fields. In fact, the original title had all fields, but uh, that plus my, our three names would not fit in the bottom. So I just deleted that part. Yeah. So this is the brief outline. So I will once again motivate the problem. Of course, we've seen the motivation for the past two days. But nevertheless, I will once again reintroduce the problem. And uh, then uh, I will talk about the uh, non-commutative rank and its various versions. And the last three sections will primarily be devoted towards uh, the algorithm that uh, we propose. Yeah. OK. So the. Motivation, uh, the first motivation comes from um, invariant theory. Uh, so we are looking at uh, uh, m-tuples of n cross n matrices uh, with entries over a field. Uh, so this is something that uh, we have seen right from the first talk of Avi and even yesterday. So we are looking at SLN cross SLN acting on tuples in the following way. A, a pair of matrices, uh, A comma B sends the tuple x1 to xm to this tuple of matrices. And uh, the classical questions uh, that, uh, 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 that people have sp sort of spoken about over the past two days, in fact, uh, Dirksen also gave us a detailed description of all of this. Uh, what are the questions that uh, mathematicians were interested in? One is, of course, what polynomial functions are invariant under the action, so that is, uh, uh, though there is a large body of work, and uh, a large body of work which was, uh, if, if especially for this problem, this was discovered many, many times, actually. Uh, Schofield, then there's Dirksen, Weyman, then there's Dumkosh, uh, Dumokosh and Zubkov, uh, then uh, we, we also rediscovered this. Uh, so uh, this problem occurs in, I'm sure there are many references which uh, I have omitted here, but uh, this is a very popular problem and was rediscovered many, many times. And uh, so, like uh, um, Ham mentioned in his talk, the ring of invariance is known to be finitely generated. And uh, there is uh, a natural question that comes up is a bound on the degree in which the ring of invariance is actually generated. And uh, uh, from previous work, so this, uh, the first three slides are, I would say, post pre-2015. So things changed dramatically after that. Uh, so the uh, bound known at that point was uh, exponential in n squared. And uh, 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 we will talk about how this comes down to polynomial in n, actually. OK, so that was one question. And the other natural question is uh, what uh, was referred to in yesterday's talks, uh, uh, Raphael's talk, uh, membership in the null cone. So what, just let, let's recall what the null cone is. The null cone is, oh, sorry. Uh, the null cone, oh, where am I? Ah. Am I going backwards? Ah, yeah. So the null cone is uh, the set of tuples A1 to AM such that all invariant homogeneous polynomials, which are not constants, vanish. Yeah, so one is looking for uh, uh, deciding membership in the null cone, given a tuple of matrices, you would like to know if it is in the null cone. So that is the algorithm that we will actually talk about today. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so there is an alternate characterization of the null cone. Uh, it is a tuple of matrices which simultaneously shrink a subspace. Again, this was alluded to in yesterday's talks also. Uh, so I will come to this definition again. So it is a subspace uh, U. So think of all of these matrices as uh, operators from uh, the n-dimensional vector space over F to the n-dimensional vector space over F. Uh, then uh, uh, we say a, sh a subspace is shrunk if there is some fixed subspace U such that each of these AIs send U into U prime, and U prime is of strictly smaller dimension than that of U. 
Yeah. Uh, you'll see this again. Uh, so given this characterization, uh, there is uh, actually an um, interesting characterization, description of the invariant ring also. So if I look at variable matrices x1, x2, xm, and I tensor it with arbitrary matrices over the field, and I calculate the, this determinant of this uh, uh, nd by nd matrix, one can easily show that this polynomial function in the variables of x1, x2, xm is actually invariant. And it is known that all invariants are actually generated by these set of polynomials. Yeah? OK. Uh, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, uh, questions one is, is A1, A2, AM in the null cone? Uh, of course, if you could write down a set of generators for the ring of invariants and check whether all of them evaluate to 0, that gives you an obvious algorithm. But uh, <clears throat> Uh, so there is an algorithm, uh, if one uses uh, what Dirksen could not sort of talk about due to power outage, uh, one gets an exponential in n squared algorithm. Uh, the other important question, uh, which uh, will uh, feature in uh, uh, Vishwambara's talk later in the afternoon, is uh, the following question. Given, a, given two tuples of matrices, one would like to understand if their orbit closures actually intersect. Uh, so this intersection uh, will be taken in the space of semi-stable points. So we will first remove points which are in the null cone. Then we will take two tuples of matrices, and we, one would like to ask if two tuples of matrices, their orbit closures actually intersect. Uh, so this is uh, very important from uh, a viewpoint of uh, mathematics, because this gives you a nice way of constructing what is uh, what Mumford uh, called the GIT quotient of this space of M tuples of matrices. Uh, so the, uh, the other motivation is uh, fairly algorithmic, actually. Uh, so if I uh, am interested in, I uh, suppose you are given a matrix presented by, say, a single generator, uh, and you would like to know if uh, there is a, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I am quite terrible at this, yeah. Uh, so one would be interested in knowing if you can sort of block triangularize the matrix, so that is, is there a block of this form? Is there a block of zeros that I can actually do by find by a change of basis? Yeah. So, uh, so this these are examples of matrices which have such uh, 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 block triangularizations. And uh, why would one be interested in this? One would be interested in this uh, because this offers a natural notion of reducibility. So, for example, if one is looking at uh, uh, Markov chains, and if one is presented with a Markov chain and one can actually block triangularize it, then there is actually a, uh, it is a, it is not an irreducible Markov chain, there is another subchain which is also Markov. Uh, then one would be interested in it uh, from in graph theory because this gives us algorithms for actually calculating strongly connected components and things like that. And uh, this is something that uh, Gabor will mention in his talk. Uh, uh, so when uh, one is given uh, uh, modules. So if, if I think of A1, A2, AM as generating set of a module, uh, then the fact that you have actually a block triangularization of this form would correspond, if there is a simultaneous block triangularization, that corresponds to uh, the existence of a submodule inside that module. So that would be also, of, uh, that is a natural algorithmic question. And uh, one is interested in solving these things. So in that case, uh, it will turn out that if I look at the last n minus k basis vector space of the given uh, generators, they actually span a module. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So uh, as was uh, alluded to in yesterday's talks, again, the Hall blocker. So one, uh, if uh, one has, say, a bipartite graph with uh, vertices on the left written down in columns and uh, along rows and vertices on the right written down uh, along the columns. Uh, one would want to know if there is a way to rewrite this adjacency matrix of this graph so that you see a large, say, block of zeros. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, so if uh, there is, so suppose you actually, so this is uh, what would be called a block, uh, a Hall blocker. So if you actually observe after permuting the vertices on the left and on the right, if there is a simultaneous permutation, if there is a permutation which allows you to sort of discover this block of zeros, and suppose this block of zeros is of size k cross l, k rows and l columns, uh, 
uh, then and suppose this block has uh, uh, so many diagonal entries also k plus l minus n and suppose k plus l minus n is strictly bigger than 0. Uh, then this actually corresponds to the non-existence of a perfect matching in the graph. Uh, so viewed from the viewpoint of uh, uh, linear algebra, so what one actually observes is that if I look at uh, uh, the span of the last L basis vectors, namely these L in this case, uh, they map into uh, the subspace spanned by the last n minus k, so this is n minus k, so n minus k in this case is 1. So uh, thought of as uh, a, an operator, this matrix now sends this subspace of dimension u to this subspace of dimension u prime and uh, the difference in the dimensions is k plus l minus n. Uh, so that immediately tells you that the rank of this matrix is upper bounded by this. Now, uh, this is for a single matrix and if I have a collection of matrices, this was what uh, we have been talking about over the past few days. Uh, <clears throat> given a collection of matrices A1 to AM, uh, so this is our collection of matrices, uh, one would, uh, uh, if, uh, so this is the standard PIT question that one, uh, that computer scientists are really interested in. Uh, namely, uh, given a matrix with linear forms in the variables x1, x2, xm, we would like to know if the determinant of this matrix is not zero. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, it turns out that if indeed each of these matrices ai, uh, suppose it is the case that AI, each of these ai's maps u into u prime, and uh, uh, this, uh, di the dimension of u minus the dimension of u prime, as in this slide, is strictly bigger than zero. So then one immediately knows that each of these matrices actually shrinks this subspace u into the subspace u prime and therefore the rank of this matrix is at most n minus, the, uh, n minus this quantity. Yeah. So you, uh, you would actually, uh, actually find a large block of uh, determinant zero there. Yeah. So that would allow us to conclude that the rank of this matrix is upper bounded. Uh, by this quantity. So in case this quantity is strictly bigger than zero, then you know that there is, uh, that this determinant is identically zero. So that is what one uh, uh, would want. Uh, <clears throat> now this PIT question, uh, so I'm, I should remind you this PIT question uh, of given a collection of matrices and would, one would like to know whether the determinant of this formal uh, matrix is non-zero. Uh, uh, this may, uh, uh, so this depends upon the underlying field that we are working on. So if uh, the underlying field is a constant size field, then in fact it is known to be NP hard uh, by a reduction from uh, 3 sat. Uh, now, <clears throat> uh, where, so that is not the case that we are going to look at. We will always assume that our underlying field has uh, at least size n, where n is the size of each of these matrices. Uh, and uh, if I have a large enough field, then in fact, uh, suppose it is the case that this determinant is non-zero formally, then there is a k cross k matrix which uh, um, uh, whose uh, determinant is non-zero, and uh, that is now a polynomial of degree k, say in the variables x1, x2, xm, and of course if my field is large enough, I can plug in values from the underlying field so that the span of these collection of matrices over this field actually contains that rank k matrix. Yeah? So this is the uh, sort of, uh, uh, so this is something that we will almost always be working in, a fields of reasonably large size. Yeah? Okay, now coming back to this notation, uh, so if there is a subspace u which is shrunk into a subspace u prime, uh, and the difference in the dimension is C, I will call that a C singularity witness for this collection of matrices A1, A2, AM. So then, uh, uh, as Avi mentioned in his first talk, uh, this is actually connected with something called the non-commutative rank. So I'll just write this notation and I will once again recall that. Uh, so NC, NCRK denotes uh, uh, the non-commutative rank of this uh, matrix family A1, A2, AM. Uh, this is going to be uh, N minus the largest C, uh, C singularity subspace. If this number is C, 
the largest singularity subspace. Uh, and uh, from uh, what we have observed, then we know that a, the non-commutative rank is strictly less than n if there is some subspace which is actually compressed. And this is really what uh, was alluded to again in yesterday's talk by Raphael, a Hall blocker. Yeah. Okay. So now, what are the various avatars of non-commutative rank? Uh, so what? So Gabor likes to call this uh, a non-deterministically complemented rank because uh, if you are given a collection of matrices and you want to test. Uh, whether there is a shrunk subspace, you can actually guess the subspace u, you can guess the subspace u prime, and actually verify that each of ai sends u into u prime, and the dimension of u is strictly bigger than the dimension of u prime. So, uh, from uh, the previous uh, slides, it is also the null cone based rank because I know that uh, by the alternate characterization which was uh, given earlier. A collection of matrices is a null cone if and only if they actually shrink, simultaneously shrink a subspace, and simultaneously shrinking implies that the non-commutative rank is actually uh, strictly smaller. So this we could also call uh, the null cone based rank. Yeah. So uh, again, all of this uh, we are all uh, familiar with. And uh, coming back to Avi's talk, uh, we could interpret rank of A x uh, in, uh, in the following way. One could interpret uh, this as taking linear combinations of the matrices A1, A2, AM with non-commutating non -commuting coefficients. So one is looking at the free skew field as Avi described, and one is actually calculating the rank of this matrix over the free skew field. Uh, now, the free skew field, as Avi mentioned, is uh, a monster, and it's a difficult object to work with, and one would like, uh, uh, so, wh so what we actually do is, to actually construct a homomorphism from the free skew field, a uh, non-injective homomorphism to certain tractable skew fields. So tractable in the sense that we can actually compute what those skew fields are and we can use that to actually calculate the non-commutative rank in the situations that we are in. Yeah? So this would be our approach actually, try and somehow get hold of tractable skew fields uh, which we can use to calculate the non-commutative rank. Yeah? So that would be our so of course, the natural question is, uh, what is the relation between RK and NCRK? So I, I don't know if I defined RK. RK is the rank of, so given this matrices A1, A2, AM, I can look at the linear span of these matrices and ask for the matrix with the largest rank in that matrix space. So that is what I will call RK of a family of matrices. And the natural question is, of course, is it true that RK is less than or equal to the non-commutative rank? Of course, if it were true, then we would not be probably here. We will all be in Monaco, perhaps, <laughs> at this point, uh, because we have actually solved this problem. Uh, so equality, uh, so uh, uh, there is an obvious counter example, namely take the uh, space of uh, skew symmetric matrices of odd dimension. Uh, then uh, since each of the, since, since uh, zero is a common eigenvector, we know that there is no matrix of uh, large rank, uh, or full rank in this matrix of space. And uh, we will actually do this by an example. We'll actually show that if I look at three cross three matrices, they don't compress a subspace. So this I will do by an example, actually. We'll actually do this. So clearly, this tells you that uh, the non-commutative rank in this case is actually three, whereas the rank uh, of this matrix space is only two. Yeah, so there is, uh, this rank is strictly, can be strictly less than the non-commutative rank. So it turns out that they, they, uh, that a rank is actually equal to non-committed rank in certain special cases. Uh, so if I look at matrix pencils, if I look at uh, uh, the span of uh, two-dimensional matrix space, uh, in that case, it turns out that the rank is actually equal to the non-committed rank. And uh, this was uh, uh, an old result of Atkinson and Stephens, and uh, probably even was even discovered earlier. I, I don't really know. Then again, in the case of rank one matrices, if each of the AIs is actually rank one, then one can actually show that this is true. In fact, this is something that uh, Gabor, I, so I'll mention that in the next slide actually. So they, I, they had actually solved this particular case in an earlier paper, and that was their motivation to come to this. Is this uh, an important theorem in uh, Rado? Yes, an important theorem of Rado, exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry, okay. Uh, so the name compression space uh, was probably first given by Fortin and Rottenier in their sort of seminal paper. Yeah, so as I said, the last three sections, we are going to sort of look at the algorithm and what is, 
I'll just give a brief overview of what the algorithm is actually going to do. So what we do is uh, we start with a matrix in the span of A1, A2, AM. And uh, the idea is to use some kind of a matching like algorithm to increment the rank of this matrix that we started off with. So we would need some analog of augmenting sequences. Uh, the right notion happens to be the second Wong sequences. I will come to that. And uh, we will do this uh, ju just like we do in matching. We sort of start with the matching and we try and increase the size of the matching. We, we're going to do the same thing here. We start starting the matrix in the matrix in the span uh, of a certain rank and we increase it by augmenting paths. And then just like in uh, the case of uh, uh, matchings, we would need a stopping rule and that stopping rule will really be a witnessing shrunk subspace. So we will develop it, the algorithm will be developed this way. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, so there are uh, um, uh, so one of the main things we do is to actually reduce computing uh, non-commutative rank to actually calculate to uh, to um, we will actually say that this number is really the rank of some matrix in our family, and we, uh, we would really be looking for a matrix A1 which has this property that its rank is really the non-commutative rank of the entire matrix family. Yeah? Uh, <clears throat> so this, uh, uh, this algorithm was, uh, um, uh, uh, so the, the, the idea of using second Wong sequences uh, was uh, proposed uh, earlier by Fortin and Rottenier, and this was once again rediscovered in the paper by Ivan Eoski, Ao Karpinski, and Santa, where they actually tackled the rank one case. And uh, they tackle one more case, which I will also describe in a later slide. Yeah. OK, so now let, let us assume that we have a matrix A1 uh, with the property that its rank is actually equal to the non-commutative rank. Yeah. And suppose you are able to find a subspace U and a subspace U prime with the following properties that A is a tuple. A is a tuple. And A. For, yes, so what we'll do is we'll replace the first one with a, a random, in, we'll take x1, x2, xm, we'll take alpha1, alpha2, alpha m, and so we can start with any matrix. So even, you may even assume that, uh, so a is a, a1 is a final matrix whose rank is actually equal to the rank of, whose, no, whose actual rank is the non-commutative rank of the entire tuple. Uh, so maybe I should not have used this notation a1, maybe I should have called it a1 tilde. Suppose I find a matrix a1 tilde, with the property that its rank is the non-commutative rank of this entire two family of matrices that was given to me. Yeah. And you're trying to understand what the CU means. So yeah. So, so, start, yeah. So, so what I'm going what I'm going to do is to, I'm going to motivate what, the second Wong sequences. The idea is why is the second Wong sequence a very natural sort of idea? So suppose you were able to find something like this. Yeah. So it'll, I, you'll um, I will come to it in a short while. So suppose this actually happens, that you do find a matrix whose rank is the non-commutative rank of the entire matrix family. And suppose you find this subspace u and u prime with the following property, that u is in the kernel of this matrix A1 that you have discovered. And each of the AIs sends u into u prime. And suppose further, this also holds. Yeah? Now note that this right-hand side is the dimension of the kernel of A1 yeah, that we have discovered. So I claim that this is equivalent to finding a matrix A1 and a subspace U containing the kernel of A1 having these two equations. Suppose you were able to find an A1 and U and U prime, that is really equivalent to these. And let us see why. So first I claim that if this happens, if these three conditions hold and U contains the kernel of A1, then in fact, the span of the matrix family that we started off with must be all of, must be u prime, and that is clear. Well, containment is clear because each of these AIs maps u into u prime, so naturally their span is sitting inside u prime. On the other hand, if I look at this span, this certainly contains the span of A1 u. Yeah, but I claim because this is the dimension of the kernel of A1, dimension of u minus dimension of u prime must be equal to the kernel of A1. Therefore, 
it must be the case that A1 maps all of U into U prime, yeah? So this equation certainly holds. And of course, it also means that if I look at the inverse image of U prime under A1, that must be all of U, yeah? Uh, well, why is that? Well, this containment is again clear because I have after all mapped A1 into U prime. I have, I have A1 maps U into U prime, so the inverse image of U prime. So by, by this inverse image, I mean the pseudo inverse of A1, yeah? So uh, this is certainly contained here because the, pre the inverse image of U, U prime under A1 certainly contains U, yeah? But then this same equation once again tells you that the dimension of U minus the dimension of U prime must, is really the dimension of the kernel of A1. So the pre-image of U prime under A1 must be all of U, yeah? So if you do find something like this, then really what one is looking for is a matrix A1 uh, and a subspace U containing the kernel of U1 and you would like to satisfy these two equations. So if I satisfy these two equations, then I claim that this is the shrunk subspace, that this is a subspace which has been shrunk into this simultaneously by all these matrices, and since this number is strictly bigger than zero, and you have actually found a matrix of this rank, th this must be the non-commutative rank of the given matrix family. The inverse image, actually, be computed by. The inverse is not defined because uh, A1 uh, has a kernel. Just the inverse, Just the inverse image, yeah. yeah. So we compute it by taking a pseudo inverse of the matrix. That's the way we compute it, yeah. Yeah, so really what one is looking for is a matrix A1 and a subspace U containing the kernel of A1. And we would like to satisfy these two equations because once I satisfy these two equations, I know that I have actually found my subspace U which, is, which shrinks into a subspace U prime. So this would be the idea actually. And how are we going to do this? We do this by recursion. Uh, <clears throat> we start off with, so of course if A1 is full rank, we're done. There's nothing to do because we have a full rank matrix in the given matrix span. So we'll assume that there is a non-trivial kernel. That is, we look at A1 inverse of zero, so A1 kills something, so we look at the kernel of A1. Then what we do is we look at the span of the, matri uh, of the matrix space A1, U1 plus A2, U2 plus AM, UM, and we look at this subspace. So I've sort of rewritten this again here. Uh, so this should remind you of bipartite matching, actually. We start with the zero vector, we pull it back under A1, we get this subspace, which is the kernel. Then I look at, so B for me will denote the entire matrix family that is presented. I will look at the image of this subspace under B, and I will pull this back again under A1, and we keep doing this. So this is what we do. So that is the augmenting sequence analog, yeah? Uh, <clears throat> so notice, that, okay, so first I should do this, I should show that these subspaces, U0 prime on the right hand side are contained inside one another, and that is clear at least in the first step because the image here contains zero. They, this is the linear span of this matrix space and therefore certainly contains zero, so zero is contained inside this. And therefore the pre-image of zero, which is this, is actually contained inside this. And this argument works at all levels. So you have a containment of these subspaces. So if I start off with, so therefore we know that this has to stop after a finite number of steps. So this will stabilize at some stable subspace. Yeah. So. And then what do we check? We need to only check if this UN prime is actually in the image of A1, because that's what the previous slide tells us. The previous slide tells us that if I start off with something in the kernel of A1, I pull it back, this kernel is finally contained, and if I, oh sorry, what am I, okay, yeah. So then all these conditions are actually satisfied. If you, if the final subspace that 
stabilizes is actually in the image of A1, then you have actually found your shrunk subspace, namely take the stabilizing subspace and uh, take the pre-image of the stabilizing subspace under A1 and this subspace U n prime, which was the stabilizing subspace, this is our witnessing pair. That, yeah? Is this clear? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Sorry? You're asserting that separator of A1 can be equivalent to U. It's possible. It is possible. No, suppose we actually get a subspace. No. Suppose I have a strictly increasing family of subspaces and I actually find a final state. And if I do find this, yeah, if, uh, uh, if the image of A1 contains this final thing, then I claim that the, uh, so I start off with this. So if, uh, uh, if I look at the pre-image of this and if this actually is the same as this, so then I've already stabilized, you see, I get nothing more. Then I claim all these matrices send this subspace into this subspace. All these matrices send this subspace into this subspace and here is a shrunk subspace that you have actually found. Yes, actually it will turn out to be the minimal. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. 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 So if you actually do this, and if uh, UN prime, uh, if the, fi uh, if, uh, the uh, final stabilized subspace UN prime is actually in the image of A1, then we are actually done. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So this is to be thought of as really matching actually, that's what we are really doing, yeah. So if not, what is the situation? Well, I have some element in the kernel, I have pulled it back using some element A1 in my, AI1 in my family, yeah. Then, uh, so, I have, so I, I have A1 inverse, this is A1 inverse, uh, so I have pulled back some element from the kernel, then there is some element AI1 mapping it to something, then A1 inverse once again pulls it into something and so on. So I keep doing this and finally I end up with this particular element in the vector space, which is not in the image of A1. That's more, if, if the final stabilized subspace is not in the image, then there must be a vector of this kind because we know that this final stabilizing subspace actually contains the kernel of A1. Yeah? When you didn't succeed. When you didn't succeed. Yes. is actually false, is actually false. Then you have to do something. And what are we going to do in that case? So in that case, we have actually found a vector which AI1, AI2, AIL pull out of the kernel of A1, actually. So let us just look at the situation where suppose I know that uh, A1, suppose I actually assume that A1 is of this nice form, that it is of rank n minus one and there is one element in its kernel, yeah? Uh, well, this can actually be achieved, in which case, yeah, so if I make that assumption, then really I can ignore A1 inverses everywhere, and if I write down uh, my matrix in this basis, the basis consisting of the image of A1 in the first n columns, and uh, the element in the kernel as the last column, and if I write my uh, rows as the first n minus one being the image of A1 and the last being the vector which was pulled out of the kernel. Suppose this is the situation, yeah? So here you have pulled out a vector using AI1, AI2, AIL out of the kernel and that is the vector which I call W. So suppose we write our matrices in this basis now, yeah? So then what are we saying? Uh, then we are saying that if I look at AI1, AI2, AIL and if I look at what this product, mate, this matrix product does to the vector A1, well, it brings in a non-zero element sitting in this n minus one comma n minus one position. This is what this will do, yeah? Because of the way we have indexed our rows and columns. Because this particular element V has been 
mapped into W plus something. Yeah. Sorry, n comma n. Everything is n comma n. Yes. Yeah. So suppose this. So the easiest case is when it happens with L equal to one. Suppose there is a single matrix which actually pulls the kernel, uh, a vector in the kernel out of the image of A1. So then I claim that we can actually find a matrix with a larger rank than what we started off with. Because if I look at this formal matrix where x is a variable, if I look at x a1 plus a i1, suppose this was, there was a single i1 which pulled it out. And if I look at this x a1 plus a i1, this matrix will have a non-zero b sitting out here. And if I calculate the determinant of this matrix, it's now a polynomial of degree n my uh, of de, uh, polynomial in x of degree n minus one plus something of lower terms. So therefore, I can find if my field is large enough, I can find an x for which this determinant is non-zero, and that allows us to increase the rank. So I can now work with this as my next a one. Yeah, plugging in a value of x that I obtained to make this determinant non-zero. So I increase the rank this way. Yeah. So this is the simplest case where there is a single matrix which pulls it out. Yeah? So of course, then we could try n different lambdas and if my field is large enough, then we are done actually in this case. We have a slightly long. Yeah. And this is the uh, thing that we have. Now let us look at a situation where I have a matrix pencil. Now I have A1 and I just have A2. I have two matrices, but L is not one. And suppose there is, so then going back to the previous slide, so these, all these AIs, AI1, AI2 are the matrix A2 in this case. So in which case, what are we saying? We are saying that A2 to the power L has a non-zero. When I, when I apply it to the element in the kernel of A1, this brings in a non-zero B here. Yeah? So if that is the situation, then I can actually do the following. I can write down in a nice basis, and this is the basis we will choose. We'll start with uh, the uh, with, so we okay. So, so in the basis, so u1 is the element in the kernel of a1. We've assumed, remember, that a1 is of rank n minus one. It kills only the last vector. So in this basis, uh, so what I will do is, so I I will pull out a1. So I will apply a1 to u1. Then I'll apply a uh, sorry a2 to u1. Then I'll apply a2 squared to u1, a2 cubed to u1, and I know that all these elements up to l minus one lie inside the image of a1. It is a2 to the l which pulls out u1. Yeah. So we'll write it in this basis. If I look at this basis and I look at the matrix x a1 plus a2, believe me, this is the form of this matrix in this case. So this is uh, so remember, remember that u1 was our last column. So eight, yeah. So if I look at uh, um, so a2 sends u1 to u2, then sends u2 to u3, and so on, and sends u l minus one. U l will pick up a one. Yeah, so there is an x here, and u l will pick up a one in the last column because it is the last column. In this, it was the in this basis, uh, the last column is. Uh, u1 is the element of the kernel. Yeah? So if I look at this, then xa1, if I write down the matrix xa1 plus xa2, I get this block here, and I get a 1 at this place, and I get an x here. And of course, these y's are also of the form x plus c, x plus d. And therefore, if I sort of rearrange these matrices, rearrange the columns and uh, rows, this is the form of the matrix I finally end up with, xa1 plus xa2. And this is really block triangular of the form we are looking for. Then once again, I can actually calculate this determinant. And uh, as a polynomial in the variable x, it is of degree n minus l. So again, if my field is large enough, I can plug in a value for x and actually increase the rank. So this is really the one of the main ideas in the entire algorithm. Yeah. So is this clear? Any questions? Okay, so this is, as I said, our idea. Uh, in general, this may not be true. I might only have, so if it is not a matrix pencil, then I have a family of 
elements in my matrix space, AI1, AI2, AIL, which actually pull out the element of the kernel. So one could do, try the following. One could actually take this matrix B and look at the nth power of B. Of course, the nth power of B includes this product, a, uh, a, AIL, AI includes this product. If I look at this, it includes this product with, uh, a, um, um, with this formal polynomial x1, x2, xl. And if I look at the lower right entry of B, of B to the L, because I know that this product actually appears when I raise B to the Lth power, I know that the lower right entry of B to the L will actually contain this term. But then it will also contain other terms which begin to interfere. And that is really the problem. Yeah? So we somehow need to unentangle this product. We, we, we would like to really work with this sum, but the sum creates a problem because when I raise it to the Lth power, like we did in the matrix pencil case, there could be interferences with the other terms that I see. Yeah? And in fact, this is as hard as probably solving PIT itself. So if you could do this, this would give you a uniform way of actually doing PIT itself. But this is really the bottleneck. Yeah? So and how are we going to do this? So this is the, so I, I will postpone that for some time. But let us now look at what happens when I, when I do this entire thing with skew symmetric matrices. So I start off with skew symmetric matrices, A1, A2, A3 with uh, this basis. Like we said, the first thing we do is to make sure that A1 is normalized so that it's, I multiply it by, um, so that A1 actually looks like, multiply on the left by this. So then all these matrices look like this. So A1 looks like a matrix of the form that we had in the previous slides. So this being the case, let us see what happens when I apply this collection of matrices to, the, we run the algorithm with this collection of matrices. So then, uh, believe me, if I look at A2 squared, it's going to be 1. A3 squared is going to be minus 1 in the second row. A2, A3 is going to be this. A3, A2 is going to be this. But if I look at the lower right entry of XA2 plus Y8, so this is what happens, actually. You calculate and you observe that XA2 plus Y8. So we had A1, and we were really trying to use the matrices A2 and A3 to pull us out from the kernel of A1. So we would, like to have, we would have liked some power, some linear combination of A2 and A3 and some power of it to help us. But really, that does not work. And in this case, we observe that this is actually 0. So if I look at the square of this matrix, I get a 0 here. So that really, this does not work in this case. It does yeah? not work, and it cannot work. It cannot work, because yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So and therefore, the last column is actually going to be when I raise it to any power, I will only observe a 0 here. But of course, we know that skew symmetric matrices do not shrink a subspace. So how can we discover that? Yeah. So the rank over the free skew field we know actually is 3. So we know there must be collections of matrices m1, m2, m3 such that a1 tensor m1 plus a2 tensor m2 plus a3 tensor m3 should have rank 3 times d. Because this we know that they don't shrink a subspace. So then we can ask ourselves, well, what if we were to work with non-commutating variables, non-commuting variables, and can you use that now to increase and augment rank? So that is really the idea. Yeah. So, so that is one idea, and the other idea is once again reduce it to matrix pencils. So remember that BL matrix that we wrote down, Xi1, A1 plus Xi2, A2 plus Xil, Al, will somehow want to reduce, use that in a matrix pencil, and we want to use these xi's are going to be non-commuting variables. And let us see whether we can actually do this. And indeed, it turns out, if by going to blow-ups and going to skew fields, one can actually do this. Yeah? So let us look at this same example, but over quarter neons. Suppose I allow myself coefficients from quarter neons. Yeah? So, uh, so I have written this down here. So if I look at xa2 plus ya3, so if I write down this where, so this is my ring of quarter neons. And if I look at the lower right entry of xa2 plus ya3, so this is xa2 plus ya3 in this case. And if I square it, so this gets multiplied by this, and I actually get xy minus yx, which is 2 times z. 
So indeed, if I look now at this matrix A1 plus XA2 plus YA3, I actually get a matrix with rank 3 over this. And if you sort of do Gaussian elimination by multiplying it on the right hand side by this matrix, you actually get a matrix of full rank. So really using a sort of increasing your coefficient space from what it was from real numbers to complex to quaternions really helps. So you can actually augment the rank this way. So this is our idea and of course there is another way to see this and this is by looking at a representation of quaternions in two cross two matrices. So under this representation, little x goes to this matrix, little y goes to this matrix, little z goes to this matrix. So if I look at this matrix that we ended up with, yeah, or this matrix, I actually see that I get a matrix like this. Now this is a matrix of rank 6. Yeah? This was the matrix of rank 6 that we were seeking to discover. So really this seems to work and the idea is to now go to larger fields actually and look at the embedding of these fields in matrix, in matrices. So this is the idea. So what, this is what we actually propose then. You look at the matrix family, you tensor it with a large collection of matrices or your base field. Yeah. And so if I do this, so, uh, so recall this was the situation we were in. We had an element in the kernel of A1 which we pulled out using all these matrices and we were looking at this matrix, we are staring at this matrix, which we know has this term, accepting that this term sort of has other terms which interfere with it. So now how do you disentangle the interference? Well, this, this interference can be disentangled if I actually do a larger blow up. So if I arrange my matrices so that if I start with D, which is of size, so L was the uh, length of the augmenting sequence which pulled me out from the kernel. If I use D equal to L plus 1 and I look at matrices of size L plus 1 cross L plus 1 and I use D equal to L plus 1 here and I start off with this matrix A1 times identity D. But now this is what we actually do here. We don't, we set up this matrix AI1 tensor A21 plus AI2 tensor A32. This is sort of chosen so that when I look at this product matrix, when I raise B, this matrix B when I raise it to its, to its lth power. So note that each of this is an ND by ND matrix. So the final thing is an ND by ND matrix. Yeah. E21 and stuff there, yeah, E21 being the elementary uh, matrix with a 1 at position 2 comma 1, E32 having a uh, 1 at position 3 comma 2. Now if I look at this matrix and I look at its powers, yeah. So if I look at, uh, so we are looking at this product, uh, AIL to AI1. So if I look at this, I get L plus 1 cross L times L times L minus 1 all the way down to 2 comma 1. And I, lo and behold, we observe this product here. We, we see this. And now if I apply it, so V1 was an element in our kernel. And if I apply this to V1 cross tensor U1, well, V1 was in the kernel of A1, so therefore uh, when I apply it to, and I look at uh, uh, the first basis element, yeah, so recall that we have arranged it so that, the, so then if I look at this, I get this product here, BL contains a term like contains this product, yeah, and this product is really this product. And if I apply it to this element V1 tensor U1, which is in the kernel of this blown up matrix, I get out something which is not in the kernel and I actually, now the interference is gone because of the way we've arranged these products. The remaining things can only give you other things actually, one can actually check this out. So this is one way of disentangling the interference that we actually saw. So now what we do is we have blown up the matrix space. We are looking at, we are staring at matrices of this size. We are looking at a matrix of this size. And we know that if I look at this matrix A prime and a large power of B, we know that an element which was in the kernel of this 
has been pulled out by a large power of this B, right? So, so therefore, if I look at this matrix pencil, the matrix pencil spanned by A prime and B, yeah, we find that this has, because we know that in matrix pencils, the matrix with largest rank, the non-commutative rank is really the same as the commutative rank. So therefore, I can actually augment the rank. So this is, so we know that therefore, we should be able to find again like we did before. So this matrix, recall, had rank, this was a matrix of rank R, this whole thing is a matrix of rank R times D. So by doing this process, we can find the lambda such that if I look at this matrix now, if I'm in a large enough field, I can find a value for lambda for which there is an Rd plus 1 cross Rd plus 1 determinant which is non-zero. So, so this, so and this we have actually found in the blown up space. So exactly like we did in the case of the quaternion. So we have gone up to a blown, blown up space and we have actually used this to augment the rank, but the augmenting cannot be done in the uh, original space of matrices we are sitting at. We need to blow up and then we find that we can augment the rank, yeah? So, so I have some time, I've got 20 minutes more, 15 minutes, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I'm not sure how much of uh, this we will, I, I will actually do, but so as I said, we, one of course needs to implement this in polynomial time and this implementation requires some care. So we would have to work with uh, skew fields. So re recall that skew fields are, uh, um, algebras where every element has an inverse, there is a product, associative product, uh, you can add two elements. And <clears throat> uh, accepting that the product uh, need not be computed, is not commutative, yeah? So we are, uh, so our skew field is going to be realized inside matrix algebras. So we are going to look at uh, D cross D matrices over uh, an extension field of the base field that we start off with. So we are looking at trying to look at, we are, and we would really like to look at a representation of the skew field inside uh, matrices of this kind. Uh, okay, so it turns out that, uh, okay, let, let me just uh, recall what skew is, this is. So it turns out that if you do have a skew subfield which spans this collection of matrices, then in fact, if I uh, look at uh, the center of uh, this uh, skew field, the center of this skew field, one knows that the dimension of d over the center is d squared for some, is always a square. So we are looking at d cross d matrices. In this case, the dimension happens to be d squared. And one also knows that d and, uh, if I look at the collection of polynomial identities over x1, x2, xk that matrix matrices satisfy, d and uh, the skew field which spans this matrix algebra is they, they, uh, D and uh, this matrix algebra satisfies the same polynomial identities. Yeah? So we are going to use skew fields now to allow us to do this blow up that we were looking at. Yeah? Okay, so as I said, so what are we going to do? Uh, like we said, uh, so we had a matrix A1 which I tensored with identity and I had these collection of matrices which are arranged in this nice way and then I found a lambda which works, which uh, so that the rank of this matrix is slightly larger than what we started off with. We started off with the matrix of rank, uh, A1 was a matrix of rank Rd, and now by this process, we have actually increased the rank of this matrix to Rd, to something strictly more than Rd. Now, uh, since we know that uh, uh, D, the D spans uh, this uh, matrix family over L, uh, I can actually find a way to write each of these matrices in terms of D. Yeah, so this is what we do. We find this and we rewrite this matrix in terms of the elements of D, the images of the elements of D. So for that, we'll write each of these matrices in the basis of D. And we will use a very important result from the work of De Graaf, Ivanios, and Ronyi. So I will talk about that in my next slide. And uh, we will actually also replace coefficients from K or even from F. So we will go down and this whole thing can be actually done over my base field itself if I make an assumption that my base field is reasonably large. 
So then we have a lemma which actually says that, in that indeed if the rank is, that if I look at these matrices, now these matrices are uh, matrices in my, so each, so I have written each of this in my, uh, over, uh, in my, uh, in, in, the, in the image of D in the matrix space. So what we actually show is that matrices in the image of D actually have rank divisible by D. So if indeed I've got a matrix which rank RD plus D, then by this process, I can conclude that the, ma that the matrix B tilde that I end up with should have rank at least RD plus D. So it must be R plus one times D. And then there is a way we come down. So I have not, I don't have those in my slides. So this, so while we blow up and increase the rank from R D to R plus one times D, one has a blow down procedure also where we can actually extract out that R plus one cross R plus one matrix, rank matrix in the original field actually. So we are assuming in this that our field size is reasonably large. Yeah. So one proof of this, Gabor will actually give it uh, by Gaussian elimination. I have a different proof in my slides. Uh, so this is what we do. We find this matrix of larger rank, then express this whole thing in terms of uh, the division algebra that we set up. So of course, for all this to be done, we would need a basis for the division algebra. We would know, we need to know how to compute in this division algebra. So all that has to be actually done, has to be done. The division algebra has to be sort of built up. So all that, uh, I, I do have slides which explain it, but I'm not sure I will actually get to it. So now we end up with a matrix of this form and this matrix we can come down to our original matrix space itself and I get a larger rank matrix. So as I said, all this one has to do it constructively and uh, for this, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so at least one tool which is very essential here, which allows us to move. So recall, uh, we, the blow up we found in this matrix space, A tensor matrices, D cross D matrices over F, but when I, replace it because I know D spans this mat big matrix family that we had over L. And then we used reduction, to, uh, we used uh, coordinate reduction to be sort of went back from L back to the base field F by uh, appropriate choice of uh, variables. So it is in this that it is easy to see that if I look at this tensor product, so I'm looking at D sitting inside D cross D matrix, the division algebra sitting inside matrices of D cross D over F. Here is where we extract a matrix of a larger rank R plus one times D. So this is, so we, we really need to go from this to this and then back from this to this. So this procedure we do via this uh, coordinate reduction tool uh, in an earlier paper. So this is really inspired by, I, I suppose, Schwarzschild. Uh, uh, so suppose I have a polynomial F uh, over a field L um, and suppose I know an alpha, I can find an, um, an instantiation of Y1 to Yn so that F of alpha is not zero. Then if, my, if I have a, a, a subset of L which is large enough, yeah, then in fact I can find elements inside the subset itself, so that when I instantiate them by elements in the subset, the F continues to be non-zero. And this is really a short zippel. You plug in, you look at Y2 to Yn now, um, and look at it, so this should have been Y2 to Yn. Uh, <coughs> you, you, you know that this is non-zero because when I think, so here is the alpha that you started off with, plug in alpha 2 to alpha N, and look at this, polynomial in a single variable y1. Now your field size is large enough, your, uh, your set omega is large enough so that not all choices of y from omega will actually kill this polynomial. So you will actually find a y in uh, this set for which this is non-zero. So you set that, then now replace, uh, fix this b1, beta1, then fix alpha3 to alpha n, let this be a variable, once again recurs. So you can actually find uh, a setting for these variables y1 to yn uh, so that over my base omega, 
over my set omega. So this is what we will assume. We will assume in all these cases that my field F is large enough. Yeah, if my field F is large enough, I can always do this. So if I have a matrix of a certain rank, then I know that there is a K cross K matrix, uh, which is as non-zero determinant. And that is really what we actually use to go from this to this and back. Yeah. Yeah, so this is something that, yeah. <clears throat> And uh, what is the regularity lemma? The regularity lemma says that if I start off, uh, actually the regularity lemma, the, probably the easier version is that if I take a matrix space and I take its dth blob, then the regularity lemma really says that the matrix with largest rank in the dth blob has a rank divisible by d. Uh, so here we have a stronger version where we say that if I look at this, so I had my original matrix space, which I, I'm tensoring it with this, and I'm looking at this tensor space, then what one is saying is that in this tensor space, every matrix has rank actually D. Yeah, it has rank divisible by D. So this is really what allows us to go from Rd to R plus 1D when I know that I have a matrix of rank Rd plus 1. So then you know that you have to be at the next multiple of R. Yeah? So as I said, uh, we would need to construct all this, you need, so there, there are non, so in fact there is a different proof of this regularity lemma, I'm not sure Vishwambara will talk about it. Uh, <clears throat> and of course we would need to do all these calculations over my L. Note that it is already fairly, becomes fairly technical because we would need to construct skew fields and we know that skew fields can only be constructed over extension fields. We don't have finite skew fields, so we would have to have transcendental extensions. And uh, yeah, so we would uh, need to use, so in fact we get around with using trans constructing skew, skew fields in, uh, um, so we will take a transcendental extension of F of uh, degree two, and we construct our skew fields inside this. So maybe, uh, so I do have slides which mention this, but I, maybe I, I'm not sure I want to actually. So, okay, so there's one more thing that I should actually mention. So, so here is the final, almost final algorithm. So we find a matrix of rank R, then we find a matrix of, then we go up to the blow up space, get a matrix of rank R D, we set up our uh, matrices so that I get a larger rank matrix. And once I get a larger rank matrix, I need uh, so if I look at this product which takes me out from the kernel, I know that if I blow up by this, yeah, so I started with a matrix of rank RD inside this blob space AD, and, um, I find a and I find a collection of matrices which actually pull me out from the kernel of the matrix of largest rank that we have in a given iteration. Then we know that we can actually, by going up, going to a slightly larger blob space, we can actually increase the rank. And uh, so this is the almost final algorithm. And in fact, if you look at this algorithm, this almost, this actually gives you an exponential algorithm. This was what our original algorithm was. But then in 2015, when we published this, soon after that, uh, uh, GGOW showed that there is a polynomial time algorithm for non-commutative rank in characteristic zero. Dirksen and Markham actually showed that this blow up that we have this blob seems to increase. So if we start off with a matrix of rank R in my original matrix space, then to increase it to at the next level, I need to blow up to R plus one, then maybe R plus two. So the final blow up size could be R times R plus one times R plus two all the way up to N. So that is really too large and that was the algorithm that we actually proposed in our first paper. Then uh, Dirks and Markham showed that really you don't need to go up go beyond blobs of n minus one, so I'll give a proof of that. Uh, then we actually use that to actually show that this actually gives you a polynomial time algorithm for calculating uh, non-commutative rank over all fields. So this is where we were till 2000, uh, th so this paper was written in 2015 end and got published recently. And recently there has been a spate of work again, where, uh, uh, so this is something that we will hear about tomorrow. Uh, the paper by AZGL, where they actually solved the orbit closure problem also. Then Dirksen and Markham used our ideas to actually sort of soup it up and they actually get the orbit closure problem using the results that I have mentioned today. Yeah. 
So now let me give a different. So Dux and Markham, as I said, show that you don't really need to go up, go beyond blow-ups of size n minus one. So let me state that as a lemma and actually prove that. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so we are given a matrix uh, A in a blow-up space uh, of rank d times n, and suppose d is strictly bigger than n plus one, then in fact we say that we can actually get a matrix of full rank inside a smaller blow up space. So this is what we say. So really this tells you that whenever D becomes bigger than n plus 1, I can actually reduce the blow up size. So this is something that we actually do. We go up, go to a larger blow up and then we once again come down by this, using this lemma. And of course this has to be constructive but this is all there in the paper, you can please refer to it. So as I said, for us D bigger than n plus 1 is, the. so I'll give a simple, simpler proof where when D is bigger than n plus 1, Dux and Markham actually show that this even works when the blow-up space is even more than n minus one. Actually, <clears throat> okay. So, so therefore, so what is this proof? So, you started off with a matrix of size full rank in the full blob, so in the blob space A times D. So, of course, I can identify an appropriate D minus one cross D minus one some matrix of A inside AD minus 1 because I know how I have taken a tensor and I have summed it. So I know precisely how these matrices have arisen from the base set of matrices that I started off with. So take an appropriate D minus 1, so by that I mean collection of blocks, D minus 1 blocks, each of each having a matrix of size n cross n. Yeah? So if I look at, so I claim that if there is a submit, there is a D, dn by dn matrix which has non-zero rank, so I claim if I look at this d minus 1 cross d minus 1 some matrix of this matrix A, I claim its rank must be strictly more than d minus 1 times n minus 1. But now this happens in a blow up of size d minus 1. And I know that in a blow up of size d minus 1, the matrix with largest rank has rank divisible by d minus 1. So once I show you something slightly bigger than this, the matrix must have full rank. It must be d minus 1 times n minus 1. It has no choice actually. Yeah, <clears throat> it has. It must be of rank d minus one times n. Sorry. Yeah. So why is this? So if I if I know that this matrix does not have full rank, then the matrix has rank at most uh, d n minus d minus n plus one. So this is what it is. But then to go from a double prime to a, well, I have added n rows and n columns. Well, how much can the rank increase by? The rank can only increase by 2n. So the rank of the final matrix that I could, that I would end up with would be at most this much. But then we've assumed that d is bigger than n plus 1. So this would mean that the rank of a prime that I started off with is actually smaller than the full rank that we actually assumed. So this tells you that really we don't have to go up to blow up of size uh, more than n plus 1. Yeah. So this is what it is. Yeah, so I'll skip these slides. Uh, uh, it's there for anyone to refer to. And uh, there is also a small proof of the regularity lemma. Anyway, Gabor said he will give a different proof. So I'll leave it here. And if there are any questions, I will take them. Yeah. Yeah.